Welcome to the CTRI seminar. It's my great pleasure as the Director of Research Education, Colin Depp is my name, um, to introduce our speaker, Tina Chambers. Um, so Dr. Chambers is a, is a wonderful colleague and a professor of pediatrics here. She is the director of many things. She has a very long bio, and I will uh, very, very much abbreviate it, but she's uh, the director of clinical research for the Department of Pediatrics. She's the co-director for the Center for Better Beginnings, and she's also the director of the Life Course Research Center at CTRI, and really is a renowned, world-renowned uh, researcher in the area of perinatal epidemiology and drug safety, which she'll be talking about today. Uh, she's also, in addition to all of those hats, is a celebrated mentor on campus. So she, in 2017, won the postdoctoral mentor of the year, and she spends a lot of time fostering the careers of uh, young scientists. And so uh, with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Chambers. Thank you, Colin. And uh, Paul Mills, who orchestrated this, uh, thank you for the invitation to do this. Uh, always appreciate the opportunity to talk about the great work that our, I think our group does. So um, the, the title of this uh, hopefully tells the story as we come back through that uh, we do have a big gap in knowledge about the safety of medications and other exposures in pregnant and breastfeeding women. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how that comes about and, and what we are and can can do about it. So these are a variety of different um, industry sponsors for some of the work that we do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the birth prevalence of major congenital anomalies or birth defects in the general population. What are some of the known causes of birth defects and other abnormal developmental outcomes? And how do we identify what are truly the only preventable, meaning environmental, causes of birth defects? Um, and then talk about one approach to trying to identify those pregnancy registries and the strengths and limitations of these. I'll give you a, a couple of examples of pregnancy registries registry studies um, that we have conducted or are conducting, and then end with um, how this feeds into changes to the product label uh, for uh, prescription medications in the U.S. and uh, the new sort of demand, or at least more glaring uh, demand for safety information for medications that may be needed in pregnancy um, or may be exposures that a woman has prior to knowing that she is pregnant. Um, so to begin with, in San Diego every day, there's about 50 babies born um, uh, in various hospitals, uh, and some at home, uh, throughout the county. And of those babies, um, two are going to have a major birth defect. Just on average, um, that's what happens in the general population. And of those two babies, uh, whatever they have, you know, one might have spina bifida and one might have an oral cleft. Uh, for the first one, uh, the pediatrician or the neonatologist um, is going to be able to tell the parents why that baby has that birth defect. So it may be that it was due to a chromosomal anomaly or it's some sort of inherited genetic condition or the mother has a known uh, underlying condition such as poorly controlled diabetes which is known to increase the risk for that particular birth defect. And why this is important you can imagine from a parent's point of view is it really is helpful to be able to A, know why this sometimes very devastating uh, event happened um, and whether or not there was something you could have done to prevent it. And it also helps those parents know uh, more clearly whether or not they have a risk for recurrence. So in the next pregnancy, what are their chances that they can minimize the risk for that same thing happening again? Um, or what is that risk if they have to face it? Uh, but for the second child, uh, the neonatologist or the pediatrician or geneticist is not going to be able to tell those parents why that child has that birth defect. And that creates all kinds of anxiety on the part of parents who worry that um, was it uh, this you know, medication that I took? Was it the fact that I you know, sprayed the garden with a pesticide? Um, was there something in my family that I don't know about? And what, is the, uh, what are the chances that this may happen with a subsequent pregnancy? So lots of angst created by the lack of information on what the cause of that birth defect is. So every 
year in the U.S., uh, about 12 million women of childbearing age are prescribed a medication um, that in the previous jargon of the U.S. FDA has been uh, categorized as potentially increasing the risk of birth defects um, if the mother used that drug during pregnancy. So those, when those kinds of exposures take place, women are uh, highly concerned that this drug may have caused uh, a problem for that pregnancy. And this is magnified by the fact that only about half of all pregnancies um, in the U.S. and most places in the world are planned. Um, so there is the, uh, the likely scenario where someone will be taking a medication or have an exposure uh, during the first few weeks of a pregnancy um, when the mother does not yet know that she's pregnant. Um, and that happens to coincide uh, with the period in embryonic development uh, when a, a birth defect is most likely to uh, be generated. So birth defects uh, affect one in every 33 babies on average born in the U.S. each year. Um, there are you know, some known uh, causes of birth defects, and they're listed over here in this panel on the right, um, such as uh, uh, dominant or recessive genes, chromosomal aberrations, um, and so on. And there are some uh, known um, uh, prenatal exposures, such as high-dose radiation, um, alcohol, and certain medications that also also increase the rates of specific birth defects. However, to this date, um, the causes of most birth defects remain unknown, and clearly some of them are due to environmental causes, we just don't know what they are. Uh, so to define an environmental cause of a birth defect, that there's, you know, quote unquote technical term is teratogen. Some people say teratogen. Um, and what that means is any environmental agent, so it could be a medication, it could be a chemical, it could be an infection, it could be a, a medical condition, uh, such as uh, poorly controlled maternal diabetes, that interferes with the normal development of the embryo or fetus. And there are a number of examples of known teratogens. I'll give you a few in the, in the next few slides, but uh, they include uh, substances such as alcohol, uh, prescription medications such as valproic acid, um, heavy metals, uh, lead, methylmercury, um, in, in, in the past, not now, diethylstilbestrol, uh, which was used during pregnancy, isotretinoin, and uh, Zika virus is probably the most recently identified uh, human teratogen. Uh, broadly defined, teratogens cause specific patterns, and I emphasize specific patterns because that's critically important in trying to understand where there might be a cause and effect relationship between an exposure and an outcome. Uh, these specific patterns of structural defects are kind of the classic um, uh, outcome of a teratogenic exposure, um, but also can increase the risk of other adverse pregnancy outcomes across the spectrum, and that includes spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, uh, fetal or postnatal growth deficiency, preterm delivery, long-term neurodevelopmental issues, and other effects such as cancers, which was the outcome associated with uh, prenatal to exposure to diethylstilbestrol. Um, so the, these range of outcomes were really interesting interested in, um, in terms of trying to understand whether or not a drug may have a teratogenic effect, uh, because we're always dealing with the issue that there's no known human teratogen that affects 100% of conceptuses. Um, so we don't have um, any known human teratogen given in you know, what would be tolerated doses um, that uh, doesn't kill the mom uh, that would um, induce 100% of those babies being born with a defect. So we're always looking at whether or not there's an increased risk for these specific outcomes, and does it occur um, in specific patterns with that exposure? So we have, uh, this is just a, a limited list of recognized human teratogens. It's not exhaustive. I've already mentioned alcohol, uh, tobacco also falls in uh, that list. Um, some anti-hypertensive uh, medications, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, thalidomide, kind of the first uh, prescription uh, medication that was identified as a human teratogen, isotretinoin, lithium, an old drug with uh, newer data still confirming uh, that it increases the risk for uh, specific types types of heart defects, uh, methotrexate uh, at, at high dose and, and even at low dose. Um, one of the more recently identified drugs, mycophenolate mofetil as an immunosuppressant. Uh, some of the anticonvulsant medications, um, some anti-cancer agents, um, some um, uh, anticoagulants, uh, heavy metals, uh, medical conditions such as a very high fever at certain times in pregnancy, uh, infections, uh, 
rubella, uh, varicella, and now Zika virus, um, high dose radiation, and folic acid deficiency. So thalidomide, as I mentioned, was the first uh, prescription medication that was identified as a human teratogen, and it kind of fell into uh, 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 fallow uh, field when this was first reported by an obstetrician in Australia and then confirmed by a geneticist in Europe, um, where uh, uh, children were being born to mothers um, who had taken thalidomide in pregnancy who had a characteristic pattern, as I uh, mentioned of uh, major structural defects, including these uh, shortened limbs or focomelia, uh, which occurred not in all uh, babies born to mothers who took the drug, uh, but in about 20%, um, and some other uh, subtle minor facial features that went along with this as well. Um, uh, but thalidomide was given as a mild sedative um, and for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And at the time, it was not thought uh, that things that the mothers took therapeutically could actually um, increase the risk for uh, birth defects. It had been recognized previously that rubella, an infection that you wouldn't want to have in pregnancy, could increase the risk for birth defects, but not a prescription medication. So this sort of opened the eyes of the world um, that, that here was something that uh, innocently you know, could be taken in pregnancy that actually could have a deleterious effect on the developing uh, embryo. Um, it, uh, shortly thereafter, within the next 10 years or so, it was recognized that Coumadin, an anticoagulant um, uh, taken at certain times in pregnancy, was associated with, again, a characteristic pattern, a different pattern of birth defects, nasal hypoplasia and stippling of the epiphyses and some other uh, skeletal anomalies. And then uh, in the mid-70s, um, uh, prenatal exposure to alcohol was identified as a, as a human teratogen. And this, again, uh, ran up against resistance because here was a you know, sort of innocuous substance used by uh, you know, millions in, uh, for general recreational use, not illegal, um, but was uh, uh, found to be associated with a characteristic pattern of structural abnormalities. And in this case, the major structural abnormality was with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is an effect on brain development, not visible to the naked eye, but the structural features that were visible to uh, the clinicians who first identified it were very minor facial features. So short uh, palpebral fissures or openings of the eye, a smoother uh, philtrum or the vertical ridges that run from the bottom of your nose to the top of your upper lip, smoother or absent, and a thin, thinner red border of the upper lip, what's called the vermilion. Uh, so instead of the normal cupid spoke configuration, a more flat, uh, thin configuration. None of which are uh, medically or cosmetically a problem for those children, but they just represent a clustering of minor differences in those children um, that are markers for the fact that uh, underlying brain development was not proceeding um, as, uh, as it should following prenatal alcohol exposure. And then, as I uh, mentioned previously, uh, most recently in the last couple of years, uh, identified uh, Zika virus as a teratogen. Um, the uh, at least initial primary uh, uh, major birth defect being a, a, a kind of unusual type of microcephaly, um, uh, so a small head size but with a, a very uh, different kind of skull morphology associated with it, and uh, likely many other uh, consequences in, uh, in addition to the microcephaly or even in the absence of microcephaly for those children. So how do we identify uh, agents in our environment, whether it's a prescription medication, an over-the-counter drug, an illicit substance? Um, even in the circumstance of new drugs that are being marketed, we typically don't have randomized clinical trials because they wouldn't be ethical to conduct. Um, although there's a lots of discussion now about uh, whether uh, pregnant women should be included in randomized clinical trials if they have to be treated anyway. Um, at least up until now, it's the very unusual 
situation where you uh, uh, have had um, IRB approval to do a randomized clinical trial in pregnant women, um, when pregnancies do occur in randomized clinical trials, typically the mother is taken off the drug um, and dropped from the trial. So we don't have kind of the gold standard way of looking at safety for medications in pregnancy due to the fact that you've got this baby to be concerned about. Um, we do have, since thalidomide uh, was identified as a human teratogen, a requirement to do preclinical animal studies in, uh, for pres prescription medications prior to approval um, in uh, at least two species. And those uh, have been informative and helpful and uh, probably, uh, to a great extent, their biggest contribution has been circumstances where they've led to a drug not making it to market uh, because of uh, adverse data from the animal studies. Um, but, but there are uh, uh, circumstances uh, where animal studies have not shown a teratogenic effect in the species where the studies were first conducted um, and where human data needed to be generated. And thalidomide is an example uh, that thalidomide is not teratogenic in all animal species and, in fact, only in selected ones. Um, once a drug is approved and marketed, we have pharmacovigilance data, and those, you know, certainly are not, they're, they're collected uh, some from mandated reporters and some spontaneously from consumers um, or healthcare providers um, with the idea that if there's a signal uh, that of uh, some concern uh, that this might be an opportunity to pick this up early. Um, I don't think there is any human teratogen that's ever been identified through pharmacovigilance data, um, and it's really hard to interpret uh, when these um, uh, data are reviewed uh, whether or not there's an increased risk because there's no, uh, typically no denominator of exposed pregnancy. So what you're looking at is adverse outcomes that coincide with exposure. And even for uh, kind of unique uh, uh, um, outcomes, which is, as I said, the rule with human teratogens, um, going back and reviewing the pharmacovigilance data, it's, it's often difficult to determine and if it could have been picked up if, if we'd looked at it a little differently. Um, the truth of the matter is that most human teratogens have been identified through case reports uh, through astute clinicians. And that's the case with um, mycophenolate mofetil, which I mentioned is one of the most recent uh, medications that's been identified. It was really a series of about 18 accumulated case reports of kids with uh, ear malformations and oral clefts um, that were uh, quite similar um, in their description uh, with a rare exposure, a medication that's used in the transplant population and, and, um, and rarely in people with, other, with autoimmune diseases, um, that this accumulation of case reports of very similar uh, patterns of malformation is what's led to um, the, the uh, uh, pretty well accepted conclusion that this is, is likely a human teratogen. Um, but in a systematic way, really the only way we have to kind of test uh, the hypothesis that a drug is or is not okay to use in pregnancy is observational studies. And there are a variety of ways of doing that. Um, we have, you know, uh, claims data that we can tap into. Um, there are uh, certainly Scandinavian countries that uh, do such a nice job of, of basically monitoring uh, pretty much every pregnancy and, and exposures um, and outcomes. Um, but in, in our um, uh, uh, area of the world where we don't have that kind of a medical care system, sort of the early uh, um, canary in the coal mine way of doing this is to do pregnancy registries. And so uh, as in 2002, again in 2007, and I believe a new one is coming out soon, uh, the FDA uh, released a guidance to, uh, to industry for establishing pregnancy exposure registries. And the, the goal of these is to try to accumulate um, exposed pregnancies, so having the denominator that I mentioned was not typically available with pharmacovigilance data, uh, to, to gather uh, information on exposed pregnancies and outcomes prospectively, so before the known outcome of pregnancy um, has occurred, uh, to try to see if there's any excess of uh, adverse outcomes in those pregnancies. And the idea is that these pregnancy registries would provide clinically relevant human data that can be used in the products labeling uh, to help uh, healthcare providers um, determine whether or not uh, they uh, could feel comfortable prescribing this medication in pregnancy or know what to tell their patients if the exposure has already occurred. 
Um, a pregnancy exposure registry is a type of prospective observational study um, that's pr that actively collects information on the uh, product under uh, study um, and associated pregnancy outcomes. And as I mentioned, it uh, differs from uh, pharmacovigilance, which is typically after the event has happened, that's when it gets reported uh, to uh, the company and to the FDA. So there are a, a fairly large number of pregnancy registries that have been established um, over the last 20 some years. Um, and they are uh, uh, listed on the FDA website, at least the vast majority of them that are approved by the FDA in the US. And some of them are disease-based, which is uh, considered an optimal way to go. So you may have heard of the antiretroviral pregnancy registry, which was established to try to look at the safety of all of the newer medications coming out for treatment of HIV positive women in pregnancy. Um, and the advantage of this, of course, is to be able to look at uh, the drug exposure, but to be able to compare outcomes with those who've had the drug exposure to those who have the same underlying disease but haven't had that specific drug exposure. So sort of controlling for the underlying condition. Um, there's also a, a, a disease-based uh, registry at uh, Mass General for psychotherapeutic medications, and there's one for uh, anti convulsant medications. So many of the pregnancy registries, pregnancy exposure registries that are focused on some autoimmune diseases, uh, including Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and now we have uh, some asthma uh, studies, um, are conducted by our group, um, the mother to baby um, uh, pregnancy studies, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about mother to baby. So Mother to Baby started out um, as a service uh, under a different name uh, back in 1979, and the first one in the world was established here in San Diego at UCSD by Ken Jones, my division chief, um, who was a, a dysmorphologist, pediatrician, um, who uh, came here uh, to, um, in the first wave of faculty at UCSD, and uh, uh, because he saw kids with birth defects and tried to determine what their uh, causes might be, he, in the post-thalidomide era, was receiving many uh, uh, telephone contacts from women and healthcare providers asking about exposures and what can you tell me about this. Um, and so it was clear that there was a need for this type of information. And so what he did was establish what was then called the San Diego Teratogen Registry. Um, it then expanded in subsequent years to be California-wide. It then moved uh, into other states where it was cloned uh, throughout the US and Canada and there's now 15 sites in the US and Canada, and there's a similar network uh, in Europe, uh, Asia, and Australia that has about 33 countries that participate. Um, so what these services do is provide individualized, evidence-based information to women, healthcare providers, and the public about medications and other exposures they may have had or anticipating during pregnancy, and also exposures during lactation, which is also another area of concern, whether or not a mother can safely take a medication while she's breastfeeding, and whether or not that medication gets into the breast milk, and whether or not it might have any adverse effects on the child. Um, the services throughout all of these, uh, uh, in the the US and Canada and European ones are provided at no cost to the patient or healthcare provider. Um, and our mother to baby service and the ones across the US are part of a network uh, called the Organization of Teratology Information Specialists, which is an educational um, nonprofit. Um, and here's the website uh, for mother to baby. Uh, that gives you uh, information on how to contact us using the toll-free number. You can also receive the information via email, and you can do this through live chat uh, in California in Spanish and English. Um, the network uh, also produces a large volume of uh, informational fact sheets that are uh, intended for the public. Um, healthcare providers use them uh, uh, widely for their patients. Um, they're uh, simple uh, front and back, one page, uh, English and Spanish fact sheets that go through the same set of questions and are uh, geared to about a seventh grade level of reading. Um, it, some of them are focused on underlying maternal conditions and many are focused on uh, medications or substances or environmental exposures. Uh, we also came into the 21st century recently uh, by adding a mother to baby app, which allows uh, um, on a uh, uh, Android or uh, Apple device uh, to be able to uh, 
text one of the services, to email, uh, to initiate a call, to engage in live chat, to learn about a study, um, and to uh, tap into um, the fact sheets. So I mentioned studies, that you can enroll in a study. Um, going back to 1979, when this first service was established in San Diego, uh, it became clear, uh, you know, was uh, very clear from the outset that there was little information in humans at all about exposures in pregnancy, um, and what we could say was based on what might have happened in a, um, a rat or a rabbit, but not necessarily um, completely extrapolatable to humans. And so there was a need to develop that information, and um, the, the sort of idea arose that here was a great opportunity as people were calling and saying, I you know, my patient or I have had this exposure in pregnancy, what can you tell me about it? Well, nothing, um, but what if we follow your pregnancy um, and uh, document the outcome of that pregnancy, and then we can uh, ultimately, with several more women like you, uh, be able to help answer that question. So that was sort of the initial um, idea behind pairing uh, the counseling service um, with a research project. Um, this has since expanded um, throughout the US and Canada. Um, so here at UCSD, we have a research center for mother to baby studies where we enroll women, pregnant women throughout the US and Canada. Uh, we identify, enroll them, and follow them up. Um, those who have exposure to specific medications and have specific conditions or not, and then we follow their children, in some cases, up to five years of age. Um, we have added a breastfeeding component. As I mentioned, there are uh, probably even less data on medications in, in breast milk. Um, so we now uh, ask participants who breastfeed to complete standard questionnaires at two and six months postpartum if they're enrolled in the pregnancy studies. And then we also have broader recruitment into uh, something called the UC San Diego Human Milk Research Biorepository, which is a collaboration with uh, ACTRI and David Boyle. And I'll say more about that later. So this is the website for mother to baby pregnancy studies where uh, individuals and healthcare providers can learn about which studies we're conducting um, and refer a patient or find out how to enroll and what's involved. So currently, we, uh, these are studies that we've either uh, recently completed or are ongoing. And as you can see in, in the autoimmune arena, uh, lots of uh, um, uh, biologics and, and small molecules, um, in asthma, a couple of medications, and then we're doing the new uh, two of the new PCSK9 inhibitors for cholesterol lowering, and then have had a uh, um, completed study on the safety of uh, pandemic H1N1 influenza uh, containing vaccines going back to the 2009 um, epidemic, and the antiviral medications used to treat those, and then we've also been looking at Tdap vaccine uh, particularly with first trimester exposure, which was um, considered acceptable uh, when there was the outbreak in California some years ago. So we have set this up as a cohort study. So this that type of pregnancy registry um, that we're conducting is quite unique. Um, there isn't another one uh, design that's like this. Um, for most of these studies, we require that women enroll in um, the cohort study prior to 20 weeks gestation. So we have a good chance of uh, looking at um, uh, capturing information about early pregnancy exposure closest to the time that the exposure actually took place. Um, so sort of helping in terms of recall um, and also gives us a little bit of a shot at being able to look at spontaneous abortion as an outcome. Um, although some studies, particularly for more rare exposures, we allow enrollment any time in pregnancy and just deal with that in the analysis. Um, they, they can't be retrospective, so in other words, they can't already have had prenatal diagnosis of a major birth defect and know that coming into the study, um, and they can't uh, enroll in the study after the baby's already been born or the pregnancy has ended. Um, we have uh, an exposed cohort, and we typically have two uh, uh, unexposed cohorts, um, and those are women who have the same underlying diseases um, but haven't had treatment with the drug of interest, and the unexposed comparison group two um, is a group of healthy women who don't have exposure to any known major human teratogens and don't have the disease or the drug exposure of interest. 
Um, the outcomes that we look at, going back to what I said originally about the range of outcomes, how important it is to be able to look at the range of outcomes and to look for specific patterns. Um, this is where this really gets uh, a, a, a little bit unique. Um, we look uh, certainly at the overall proportion of live-born babies and all pregnancies, excluding those that are lost to follow-up, that result in any major birth defect. Um, but that's sort of a big first pass because, as we said, we're really interested in if a, we think it's a drug-related cause, um, whether or not there's a specific pattern of birth defects. And so the overall uh, number of birth defects, if it's elevated uh, with a particular exposure, then what you want to see is, is that elevation due to a specific clustering of birth defects. We also look, um, and going back to that example of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, we look for a specific pattern of minor malformations. Um, so as with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, um, if you didn't look uh, for the minor malformations until that child had neurodevelopmental problems or had an MRI or whatever, you might not know that there was an effect on brain development. And so uh, the specific pattern of mi minor malformations we look at uh, by, by examining those children for clusters of those, and we do that with a specialized study examination, which I'll say a word about in a minute. We look at whether, uh, to the extent we can, whether there's an increased risk of spontaneous abortion, preterm delivery, um, reduced birth weight length or head circumference, postnatal uh, growth, um, and then for many of these drugs, uh, because they're immunosuppressive, we look at whether there is an increased risk of serious or opportunistic infections in uh, the children, uh, and uh, whether or not there are any malignancies diagnosed in those children. And for some studies, we do neurodevelopmental outcomes, both from maternal questionnaires and with face-to-face -face testing. So this is the schema of how, how these studies are organized. Uh, so uh, referrals come into our research center here, and they can come from these uh, mother-to-baby services throughout the US and Canada, but they also come directly from healthcare providers. They come from pharmaceutical company sponsors who uh, financially support some of our studies. And then they're self-referrals. So we do a, a wide variety of social media advertising and so on uh, that bring uh, uh, women to us directly. Um, once the referral is made, um, the callers are screened, and then it's the woman who's enrolled, um, and she can be enrolled in one of the three cohorts. Um, and during pregnancy, um, she may go through uh, two to three interviews about all of her exposures and other covariates uh, in pregnancy in all three cohorts. And then at the end of the pregnancy, there's an outcome interview, um, and medical records are uh, requested and reviewed from the obstetrician, pediatrician, hospital of delivery, any specialty physician um, and any other um, uh, specialist who might have been involved in the child's care. And then, uh, as I mentioned, a unique feature of most of these studies is having uh, the ability to capture systematically um, these subtle minor uh, um, uh, anomalies um, that you know, occur in the general population uh, fairly frequently. Um, but the idea behind this is to be able to see if there's any uh, particular cluster of minor anomalies that's seen in the exposed cohort um, that's not seen in the disease-matched or healthy comparison cohort, um, which suggests that it may be due to the drug. And uh, it certainly can be due to other factors, but at least that gives us a first pass to see if there's something that we should follow up on. And those dysmorphological examinations are conducted by uh, one of a team of five uh, pediatrician geneticists, uh, dysmorphologists who travel to do um, house calls. So they actually go and see the family in their home. Um, and uh, uh, examine the child not knowing which cohort the mother is in um, or the child and then uh, provide feedback to the parents about the results of that. And then I mentioned that for some studies we have neurodevelopmental testing or maternal questionnaires. So the dysmorphology exam, just to reiterate, um, is uh, the purpose of this is to pick up um, any subtle minor anomalies. We use a checklist of 132 um, that can include, you know, uh, as shown on the right here, uh, subtle things like uh, ear pits um, uh, or a, a unusual configuration of the um, cochlea and so on. 
Um, we, as I mentioned, in terms of the uh, interviews that are conducted and then also the medical records abstraction, we collect information on uh, age, race, ethnicity, body mass index, socioeconomic status, prior pregnancy history, um, comorbidities, um, folic acid, vitamin and supplement use, and then detailed information on alcohol and tobacco use, other medications and vaccines. And then uh, for uh, most of our studies, we've inc included measures of underlying disease severity or symptoms. So for example, if the mother has asthma uh, at each one of the interviews, she's asked to respond to questions um, from a validated instrument, the asthma control test, uh, to try to address the uh, issue of uh, differences between uh, groups in terms of underlying disease severity. Um, just so that we don't lose information, particularly with rare exposures, if a, a mother contacts us who has exposure to the uh, drug of interest, but she doesn't meet the cohort criteria, so it's retrospective, or she enrolls past 20 weeks or whatever, um, we do uh, go ahead and enroll her. We just enroll her in a separate group called an exposure series um, that allows us to uh, have as complete information as we can about women who have exposure and can help uh, sort of illuminate um, if we do have a finding in the cohort study, is it something that we see as well in this uh, exposure series? So these, uh, this work uh, has been going on since the um, early 2000s and has resulted um, in a number of different uh, publications. And one of the things that I think has been a really nice um, addition going back to the idea of having a disease-based registry is the opportunity to be able to delve down and look more, um, at, at least in this cohort and the several thousand who are enrolled now, um, about what are some of the things that are going on with respect to disease. Um, and this uh, granted, these are not the same as studies that are conducted by uh, clinicians who have access to and, and can include uh, uh, many more laboratory-based um, measures for, uh, for their patients, but we think that there are, are some contributions that we can make in understanding uh, disease severity and measures as, as to how they contribute to pregnancy outcome. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples um, the, of uh, data that have been generated from this study and how it panned out out and how we interpret it, and I'll take about uh, maybe 10 minutes to go over this and make sure we have a little bit of time if there are any questions. So etanercept, uh, as you're probably familiar, is a medication um, that's uh, been on the market for quite some time when it was one of the first biologics. Um, this uh, study was initiated um, because of a new indication for the drug for psoriasis, and so a pregnancy registry was, um, I believe, asked for, and that's why it was done. Uh, so we initiated a prospective cohort study in 2005, completed in 2005. 14. Um, the target sample size was 900 pregnant women, 300 with etanercept exposure for one of the uh, approved indications, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, or ankylosing spondylitis. 300 women who didn't have etanercept exposure but had the same diseases. And then for uh, purposes of efficiency, because we've uh, been collecting um, outcomes in a uh, similar fashion in California for several years, we uh, tapped into historical uh, non-diseased healthy comparison women and used those data as the secondary comparison. Um, see, we uh, looked at um, uh, all of the outcomes I mentioned previously, um, and we did find uh, an increased risk of major birth defects um, overall in the etanercept exposed group, uh, but upon review of those uh, birth defects, we didn't find any particular pattern of defects um, in those that were seen in that group. Um, we didn't, um, we pursued a, a, a finding of uh, a, a few pairs of children who had the same uh, cluster of minor malformations and didn't find anything there, and we didn't find significant differences between the etanercept exposed and disease match comparison uh, pregnancies for all other outcomes we evaluated through one year of age. And these data um, have now been incorporated into the new label. So just briefly to go through this, um, there's, uh, we had 370 etanercept exposed, 164 diseased unexposed, and then that historical comparison group of 296. And they were, uh, you know, described here. Uh, they typically enrolled at the end of the first trimester. Um, they, uh, the women in the etanercept group had a, a, a stronger history of a previous preterm birth, um, and they were more likely to have had an IVF-assisted pregnancy. 
Uh, they were less likely to have used vitamins preconception uh, or vit multivitamins containing folic acid uh, compared to the diseased unexposed group. Um, the groups were similar in terms of tobacco um, and alcohol use, um, and they were a, a little less likely than the diseased unexposed group to have comorbid asthma. So we, as I mentioned, we did measures of disease severity um, or symptom control, and there are three measures here that I won't go into, but basically we're comparing um, the etanercept exposed uh, mean values here at the time of enrollment, and then again in the third trimester on these three measures to those in the disease match group who uh, responded to the same measures about um, uh, disabilities and, and uh, pain and the impact of their underlying disease. And so for rheumatic diseases, we found no significant differences at enrollment or in the third trimester, and for psoriatic diseases on two measures, we found no significant differences either. So they seem to be fairly well um, com comparable, at least on that those measures. Um, in terms of outcomes, uh, we had um, a, a higher rate of twin pregnancies in the etanercept exposed group. Um, we had uh, very few, one stillbirth um, and a few elective terminations. And we had what we feel very proud of, a low loss to follow up, so overall less than 5%. I mentioned before that we did see an increased risk in major birth defects overall. So you can see highlighted here the adjusted odds ratio for major birth defects was uh, a, a little more than a doubling of risk um, with a lower bound of the confidence interval that was above one, um, but no specific pattern um, identified in those uh, uh, babies. Um, those uh, children, um, about um, uh, or 500 who received a physical examination by one of the dysmorphologists. Uh, we did see in the etanercept exposed group um, th uh, three pairs of children who had the same uh, um, uh, minor malformations, sort of cluster of malformations. And so of those six children, we didn't see those same clusters in the other two groups. So what we did is recontact those parents, and five of the six were re-examined. Um, the parents were examined, and the children all went through face-to-face -face neurobehavioral testing. Um, and all uh, performed in the normal range uh, for their age. So we, we concluded from that that we didn't see anything that was um, of particular concern. Uh, we found uh, actually a lower risk of spontaneous abortion in the etanercept exposed group, although not significantly so. And we found a similar rate of uh, preterm birth in the etanercept exposed compared to the disease match group, um, but a higher rate than in the non-diseased uh, healthy comparison group, which is uh, the diseases, these diseases themselves have been associated with uh, preterm delivery. And just briefly, we didn't see differences in children who were small for gestational age on weight length and head circumference. Uh, we didn't see differences in terms of infections or hospitalizations or malignancies. Um, in infants followed to one year of age in the etanercept exposed group uh, compared to the diseased unexposed group. And uh, developmental screening we did at about one year of age using the ages and stages, so a maternal questionnaire but a validated instrument. Um, and we saw um, no significant differences on being uh, uh, screening uh, positive on uh, specific domains or combinations of domains in the etanercept exposed group compared to the diseased unexposed group. So the second example I'm not going to spend a lot of time on is a, another collaboration that involves a, uh, our group uh, conducting the pregnancy registry arm, uh, but taking advantage of the need for having um, parallel uh, studies of different designs so that we aren't kind of in the position where you conduct a pregnancy registry study, you have a finding or don't have a finding, and then all, you have to wait you know, another five years um, or longer to have a second study done, uh, maybe of a different design to either uh, replicate or, or uh, not replicate those findings. So we set up uh, in 2009-10 um, the Vaccines and Medications and Pre Pregnancy Surveillance System, or VAMPS, um, under the umbrella of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And so what this is set up to do is to have a prospective cohort study, which is the one that we conduct, but in parallel at the same time to uh, uh, run a case control study uh, using the Sloan Epidemiology Center at Boston University's birth defect study, and then 
uh, in the last few years, we've added a database study using claims data from Medicaid and commercial claims um, with the Harvard Pregnancy Research Group. So the first uh, couple of publications that came out of that uh, were actually not only done in parallel, but published in the same journal back to back, um, the risks and safety of pandemic H1N1 influenza vaccine in pregnancy with our cohort study and the case control study uh, coming up with pretty much the same conclusions that the vaccine uh, uh, didn't seem to be associated with um, uh, increased risks of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And it, this turned out to be really important when there was uh, recently a finding from Vaccine Safety Data Link uh, suggesting that there is an increased risk of spontaneous abortion with uh, influenza vaccine, which came out last year right at the beginning of the influenza vaccine um, uh, season. And so this was really one of the only other sources of data to say that we didn't have that same finding. So last, I'll end here in a couple of minutes talking about the breast milk repository that I mentioned earlier. Um, we, uh, as I said, were really interested in being able to provide data about um, uh, medications and lactation, um, but they're unlike pregnancy registries, which are often a requirement or a commitment of pharmaceutical companies as uh, a drug gets approved, um, they, they agree to do the post-marketing study or provide funding for a group like ours to do it. Um, there is no typical requirement to do this sort of thing for drugs and breast milk, and so there are very few data that are available. Um, so we t uh, took the opportunity to sort of piggyback on the pregnancy studies and to go to the general public uh, to try to build a research resource that could be used not only for uh, testing the presence um, or absence of drugs and breast milk, but also uh, to do multiple other uh, types of research projects, which I won't go into. So um, what happens is women d agree to enroll. Uh, they, we recruit them through social media, through uh, WIC, through um, newborn nurseries, um, and through um, uh, our other pregnancy studies. Uh, they provide at least a 50 milliliter milk sample up to a full pump. They can bring it in locally um, and use our pump, or they can mail it. Uh, now with ACTRI collaboration, we're starting to do collections at the um, San Diego Blood Bank, which I'm excited about. Um, and then the samples are aliquoted and frozen uh, for future use. Um, we collect information on demographics, maternal and child health, uh, exposures day by day over the last 14 days. Um, we capture uh, medical records. We have an infant adverse uh, reaction checklist, and we get uh, questionnaires from the mom on stress, anxiety, and depression, and food frequency. And then the mothers complete uh, neurobehavioral uh, questionnaires between 12 and 36 months, and then there's face-to-face -face testing uh, for a subset. So this, on the website, you can go on there. Uh, uh, RTI was nice enough to put this up for us. Uh, you can see at any point in time the total number of aliquots available, number of mothers that are enrolled. It's about 1,400 now, where they're distributed across the US, uh, the age of the child when the sample was given. So uh, right now, we have about 1,400 mothers enrolled with samples banked in the repository and just ha have completed and now trying to look at how to present this uh, simultaneous analysis for the first 600 samples uh, with Rob Knight on the microbiome, um, with Peter Dorstein on, on targeted metabolomics, with Lars Bode on the human oligosaccharides, and with Jay Kim macronutrient profiles uh, for those milk samples. Um, first publication that came out of the repository came out a couple months ago in pediatrics, uh, looking at a hot topic in California, uh, which is cannabinoids in breast milk. Um, and so this was a study that involved 54 mothers who had provided samples to the repository and told us over the last 14 days uh, how much marijuana they had consumed, uh, analyzed by Berkey Best in the School of Ph uh, Pharmacy here. And uh, for, for the 54 samples from 50 mothers, the majority used marijuana by inhalation, some a combination of edibles or other uh, intake roots and inhalation, and the majority used one time or more per day. Um, we were able to detect uh, Delta 9 THC in 34 of the 54 samples um, with a wide range, as might be expected based on the timing of the last use, and then only five samples were we able to detect uh, any of the other metabolites. And as you can see here, uh, this is the time since last uh, use of marijuana and the Delta 9 THC uh, log concentration. And so you can see time since last use is negatively correlated with the concentration, but 
um, importantly, there was uh, at the outlying uh, end of the range, um, up to six days um, after last reported use, we were able to detect, detect uh, some level of Delta-9 THC. So the end part of this is how this all plays into the pregnancy uh, label um, and lactation label. So if, if, you know, if you're a consumer, you probably don't read the label um, of, a, of a product that you take, at least the section uh, that relates to pregnancy and lactation, unless you're pregnant um, or breastfeeding. Uh, but in the old uh, system that has just been uh, uh, completely revised, um, the, there, what happened was that drugs were uh, ascribed a category A, B, C, D, or X, um, and that was proposed by the drug company and agreed to by the FDA and was used by prescribers and patients um, as sort of a ranking uh, to um, understand whether or not the drug was uh, safe to use uh, in pregnancy. Um, but uh, this led to false assumptions that drugs in the same category, for example, a category X, which would indicate that the drug is contraindicated, um, are really known human teratogens when that was not the case. It still is, uh, hasn't been the case that there are drugs in category X that there is no data in humans that shows that they are human teratogens um, and others that are. Uh, so you can imagine that seeing that, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant and I've taken a category X drug would create a lot of uh, anxiety on part of patients and providers as well. Um, and the most approved drugs were in category C, kind of a limbo area where there could be both adverse animal data or no animal data at all. So the new label uh, revised in 2015, uh, effective June 30th, um, has uh, new revised sections. And uh, the, what's required is removal of the category ABCDX and a prominent listing of information for pregnancy registries. And then instead of the ABCDX, a narrative presentation of information um, on the drug, a risk summary, clinical considerations, and supporting data, and requires that it be updated as new information becomes available although it's unclear what would actually stimulate that. And then the lactation subsection now also does require information about the drug while breastfeeding, including the amount of drug in breast milk of its known, effects on milk supply, and potential effects on the breastfed infant. And then there's a subsection now on um, fertility, uh, pregnancy testing, and contraception. So this was implemented, as I said, June 30th, 2015. Um, as of this last summer, the ABCDX is supposed to be off of all uh, drugs labels, whether they were marketed before or after 2001. Uh, drugs marketed after 2001 have to revise their label to the new format uh, by uh, 2020, and all new drugs marketed since that June 30th, 2015 have to use the new label format, so you're starting to see them now. So the, the situation is such that um, it's now, I think, as these new labels become available, um, it's clear that the summary statement um, it no longer is a C. It basically says there isn't a sufficient information uh, in humans to be able to say um, you know, what we would like to know about that drug in pregnancy, so all the more need to have these data. Um, and this brings me back to, a, this is a publication that uh, uh, came out in 2011. It was a repeat of a previous analysis and if you did it today, it wouldn't look any different. Um, but what they did was look at uh, uh, 172 drugs approved by uh, FDA from 2000 to 2010 um, using a external uh, risk rating system uh, that's used uh, in the field. And then they also looked at 468 drugs approved from 1980 to 2000 to determine if revisions in the risk categories using this external system based on new data have been made in the last 10 years. And they found that for 97.7% of the new drugs, the human pregnancy risk was undetermined. And uh, the amount of data for those older drugs um, uh, was uh, uh, unlikely only 5% had changed a full risk category from undetermined or to any other category over the past 10 years. So clearly a huge void um, in this information, and yet uh, medications um, are needed by pregnant women just like they're needed by every one of the rest of us um, at certain times um, in our life and for certain conditions, so all the more need to develop this kind of information and to be able to have it available so we can uh, use products as they need to be used. Thank you, and I'm more than happy to take any questions if you have any, and, and certainly you can contact us if you wish. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. 
So with the new FDA ruling that pregnant women should be in drug trials, how are we going to get drug companies to allow them into drug trials and how are we going to get IRBs to approve allowing pregnant women in these trials since they've been you know, a vulnerable population and nobody right. wants to touch them. And right. So the question, if I can paraphrase a bit, is if um, the uh, approach to including pregnant women in clinical trials is changing, and I think that it is, um, the FDA has come out with some uh, uh, recent guidance on that, um, at least for public comment, um, how are we going to get from uh, where we are now to where women can not only feel comfortable being included in trials, but uh, sponsors of drug trials, um, the, the drug manufacturers are going to feel comfortable allowing them to be in the trial. So we do have some experiences, um, as you know, for medications that are used for pregnancy conditions, so like progesterone, for example, where it's, it is feasible to do clinical trials. In you know, many years past, that's how we first identified that folic acid prevented neural tube defects. Um, we, we really, that was the gold standard study, was a randomized trial. Um, in UK that included uh, uh, folic acid alone, a multivitamin cont containing folic acid or, no, or not folic acid. So it is possible to do them ethically. So the question is, what are the things that would need to ta uh, be in place for the drug company or the, um, and the pregnant woman to feel comfortable and the provider to feel comfortable having the woman be in the study. And you know, I, I used to have some concerns about it as well. Uh, part of the reason is, is that um, our scientific responsibility for the woman who participates in a clinical trial, that there is going to be scientifically useful information that will come out of it. So if you have a drug that, you know, five women are going to use ever, um, and that's all that is identified in a clinical trial, it's I, how, how confident can you feel that the drug is safe based on that end? Uh, maybe not. But there are other conditions where, you know, a woman has chronic hypertension and she's going to need to be treated with something and maybe she's not as, as, as you know, optimally controlled as she could be on a particular drug. Um, other chronic conditions like asthma, where the mother might be treated, um, uh, being be being treated throughout uh, pregnancy anyway, and where there might be some ethical considerations that would allow you to do that. Um, in, if you read through the guidance, it's, there's some things said about that the animal data have not been raised concerns, so that there's some level of confidence that there wasn't a signal with the animal data. Um, maybe uh, some understanding about uh, the mechanism of action and whether or not the how you know quickly the drug clears. Does it is it known to cross the placenta? All of those kind of uh, pharmacologic, pharmacokinetic uh, uh, pieces of information might help um, this to move forward. But I can, I, I, I am sure that there will be a period of time where there'll be angst about whether or not this this can be done. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Well, I appreciate you taking the time to listen today. And uh, if you have friends or family who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have them contact us. <laughs> okay, thank you.